a Podcast One production. Hi, I'm Sarah Wilson and this is Wild, a podcast about living a more beautiful and fired up life. Here we will continue my 10-year nomadic journey living out of one bag in search of more connection, more awakeness, less consuming, less loneliness and less bloody scrolling. I'll be inviting you to join me in finding better ways to radically love and save our one wild and precious life on this planet. In this episode, I speak with singer-songwriter Sia. Hi, Sarah. Sia is one of the most gifted and wild creatives, I reckon, on this planet. And she's wonderfully brimful of anomalies and paradoxes. She's written more than 100 of the biggest hits in pop music for Kanye, Beyonce, Rihanna. That would be the 2012 chart topper Diamonds, which I'm sure you've heard. She wrote that in 14 minutes. But she hates being famous. She famously got upset when she wrote a song for Alicia Keys and they used her voice instead. That was Titanium, and I'm sure you've heard of that too, which she wrote in 40 minutes. Her music videos have been viewed like billions of times online, but she doesn't show a face on stage and makes deals with her publishers to not have to do any publicity. But I think what I've always found to be the wildest thing about Sia is the way she talks about her creative process and the way she has to manage it with her deep mental struggles, the intersection of art and personal pain and loneliness. I wrestle with it deeply myself, my own struggle with my bipolar highs and my creative lows, including suicide, and I've cried through each of the very few interviews she's done over the years because she's that private. But this time as we talked in and around her latest creative experiment, her debut film, Music, I made her cry. <laughs> me cry. <laughs> The movie stars Kate Hudson and Leslie Odom Jr. from Hamilton, as well as Maddie Ziegler in the role of music, a teen on the autism spectrum. Now, for context, and you'll need it for this chat, Maddie is Sia's muse, and she says she can't create anything without Maddie by her side. Also, when we spoke, Sia had copped a mountain of abuse for not casting an autistic actor in the role. Our chat is revealing to the extent to which she tries to own this. We only had 20 minutes together because it was one of those media junket situations. So we dive straight in. Hello, Sia. Um, I've got to tell you, I've been pretty nervous slash excited about um, chatting to you. And really, I've been building up to this chat for, for many years. I've kind of watched you from the sidelines and in sort of parallel. Um, I've also got bipolar. I've also got thyroid disease. Um, and I've also been quite oh. vocal on um, several suicide attempts. And now I foster children and I just feel um, a somewhat of a connection with you. Yeah. I almost think that those four things must come as a package, you know. <laughs> you got one, you, you get them all. Well, I would agree. And I would also go back to your psychiatrist. I don't know when you got diagnosed with bipolar, but it, I, for me it turned out that that was a misdiagnosis and that I was actually, I had complex PTSD. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that. Yeah, that they often, they often get, um, mixed up. Yeah, look, I've got the same thoughts and I've written a book about it and um, I've heard your thoughts on the, the PTSD and I, what I find interesting is the actual modalities that you turn to to work with it and heal it and modulate it and thrive with it because I think that's the more interesting bit out of it all. It doesn't matter what the diagnosis is to a certain extent, it's what you can then work with to kind of get your life thriving i'm doing something called idealized parent figure protocol oh yeah tell us take a google <laughs> go down that go down that drain for a while yeah yeah i'll <laughs> see if it ends me up in a, a conspiracy theory somewhere um so look um in some ways my nervousness comes from almost not wanting to meet 
part of myself. And um, I don't know if you've, your people have been telling you what this podcast is about, but essentially I explore wild ideas and it's really a self-serving project to help me get more in touch with my wildness as I enter my late 40s and really want to get real about the way I live my life. So really the idea that I had that I wanted to explore with you, and I stick to one idea, which is good because we've only got 20 minutes together, came from the show notes to your new movie, um, Music. And I really think that the show notes should be released with your movie. I think everyone who goes to see it should read the show notes because it's such a great indication of how everyone who worked on the project felt about things and how they saw your creativity. But there was one line that came from Leslie Odom Jr., who's one of the main stars in the movie, and he says that, he's talking about you, that Sia doesn't drop or doubt ideas that come to her. And he was sort of saying that you just run with an idea, you trust it, you go there. And that that in itself um, gets people really comfortable with kind of their own creativity and their own limitlessness. Do you reckon that sounds about true? Do you agree with him on when he's describing your creative process in that way? Well, I I know that I, in my personal life, I'm extremely afraid. Um, but in my work life, my professional life, I've never, I've never really been afraid until it came to making this movie I had to really de- develop the courage um I thought it was a big risk and given that you know um I was working with a lot of dif- like a lot of underrepresented um m- minorities you know mm. um sick people people you know with healthcare problems or mental illness problems, addiction problems, and then um, uh, on being on the autism spectrum or being a caregiver for the uh, for someone on the autism spectrum or anyone with um, special needs um, or special abilities, depending on how, or how you like to phrase it. Um, I know that I have always been a risk taker in my within my professional world and that once and I'm extremely decisive and I I go I work with my gut yep and uh and I trust my gut every time um and that it's really all I work with is intuition and gut and so I think probably because they had seen that that had worked for me musically um, and with my music videos since I'd started directing with uh, my friend uh, Dan Askill, yeah. um, who's an Australian uh, director, um, we, we started working together on Chandelier and that was the first piece of, like, visual art that I had participated in that I thought was really beautiful and special and I think the four of us, the uh, the choreographer, Ryan Heffington, Maddie, myself and Daniel, we, we sort of became a little team and I didn't want to work with anybody else. And then when it came time to make this movie, we'd made enough things and I'd learnt enough from Daniel that I thought that I might be, I might be ready to direct on my own I might be ready I wasn't sure but (laughs) and so I asked a lot of people a lot of different actors that I'd worked with um like on my nostalgic for the present tour video I'd worked with Paul Dano and uh Ben Mendelsohn and Kristen Wiig and before that with Shia LaBeouf and um uh and I and Lena Dunham and so I asked them like do you think I'm a director or do you think I'm just a singer with good ideas and um all of them said to me they thought I was a director and I really needed to hear that because um I was still a little bit insecure and so I I just I just leapt off the cliff (laughs) yeah right and then Leslie came with me Maddie Maddie came with me Kate came with me Uh, I started the every day with like we're doing this 
for other people. Let's keep our egos out of it. Like this yeah. is a movie that's about being of service to these underrepresented people. Um, so let's all just try and have a lot of fun and um, be real sensitive and do our best to um, represent accurately what the lives of people uh, living under these circumstances are like. I want to come back to that leaping off the cliff and listening to your gut stuff in a minute, but what I might get you to do is actually you're probably very well versed in this. Can you give me like a two or three line synopsis, elevator pitch of your new movie music? Yeah, I say it's like Rain Man but with girls, the musical. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many kids who never saw Rain Man that that'll mean absolutely jack shit to them. Um, But... Uh, so for them, I would say, you know, it's it's a story about love and connection and um, finding your voice. And, uh, and told through and, the story of two sisters, one who is troubled for her own reasons. She's f***ed up a life with, you know, addictions and so on and she's had to come around to look after her younger sister who's on the autism spectrum. And so you see this tussle as they try to get to a space of of loving each other via dance and song. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, just your regular everyday movie. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You've been, you've got criticism and, uh, for ableism, basically not casting somebody on the spectrum in the main role as music. The main character is, in fact, called music. I don't want to go into that too much, but I will just ask you, like, where are you at with that at the moment? Because you got into some Twitter mischief around it. I should never have. I've got a rule, and that is I don't tweet after midnight, but I just, I was so like, what? I was so stunned by the um, criticism um, uh, because that nobody had any information. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't know that I actually had cast 13 euro atypical people and, um, And a lot of other unrepresented, you know, uh, there's a whole movie um, that uh, uh, talks about how trans people are cast as prostitutes or they're usually the first to get killed in a movie or, you know, and and I cast um, all my trans people as doctors and nurses and, um, uh, you know, and then I... I, I got misunderstood there uh, as well. Or I got a- attacked for saying, and you know, I, any, I couldn't say anything right, actually. Yeah. They also didn't know that I had actually tried to work with um, a neuroatypical actor to play uh, music, and her mum had said this is too stressful for her. And, and my fault, definitely, is didn't occur to me to try and find someone who was still autistic but perhaps higher functioning so that it wouldn't have been as stressful. Um, I I wasn't thinking laterally. I also love working with Maddie. I had originally planned to work with Maddie. Then I had, after taking under much consideration, a lot of suggestions from other filmmakers that I should try and use a neuroatypical actor. Um, uh, I I tried that. And then when her mum said, no, this is too stressful for her, I I I took that and went back to Maddie. Yeah, you know I think I am, I am ableist. I didn't realize I was. I I had no idea. I think it's a lot, a lot like a lot of us Australians don't know we're, that we're racist. Oh God! Until yeah. we leave Australia, um, you know. And and um, I'm certainly when it comes to you know viewing myself as. Maddie's bonus mum um, and joyfully being, like, given the opportunity to share um, in mothering her by her mum, who's generously, because I'm infertile, let me, like, play bonus mum to Maddie. Yeah. Um, who, when I first met, it felt like I was meeting, like, it felt like I was meeting my 
child for the first time you know when they say if you have children I don't know but no. they say you have that you experience this unconditional like love like you've never felt before or ever before and it's so much oxytocin and blah 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 well, that's actually what happened to me when I met Maddie <laughs> and um was she eight she was 11 when we met okay yeah and she did chandelier and I'm just lucky that her mum was compassionate enough knowing that I was infertile that she let me um you know, be Maddie's bonus mum. But hey, listen, Juliet Lewis is in it, and it's really funny because this is another thing we've got in common. I have met so many of my true soul friends over the last couple of years from living on the road. Um, I've lived on the road for sort of almost 10 years out of one bag, and Juliet Lewis is someone I met on Instagram, and I've met so many people via social media as well. Did you meet her on social media? I actually didn't. I had a very brief stint as a Scientologist, um, uh, how 12, 13, 14, 15 years, 14 years ago maybe. Um, and I think I met her through um, some of those fr- friends, like maybe through Beck or something. Yeah. Oh, but I really liked her. I liked her a lot. And then I just bump into her all the time, even after I, I had bounced from Scientology. Um, I would see her all the time. And um, uh, actually the um, uh, Gabby Hoffman was, was due to play her role. Mm-hmm. And then something very unexpected happened. And the day before... Um, Gabby's scene, um, she was unable to uh, attend and not due to Gabby's fault at all. Yeah. And um, and I thought, fuck. I think I had less than 24 hours and I was like, who the fuck do I know? Who the fuck can I get to? Like Gabby Hoffman is so amazing. Like who the fuck am I going to, how can I replace her if she's, Oh, she's so gifted. And and then I realised that I didn't really know Juliet that well, but I we'd always had such a good time dancing on the dance floor <laughs> and I loved to dance and so does she. And so we would, and that's really how we connected was dancing, just dancing when we'd see each other at parties, we'd just dance together. Yeah. And, um, and, um, and I... I mean, she's such a, she's fire. She's like one of the greatest actresses of all time. And so I thought this is such a long shot, but I, I, I got her on the telephone and she said if I would do a writing session with her, um, that she would do it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still waiting to fulfill that promise, but I'm ready whenever she's ready. So I just want to go back to the sort of the film, and if you don't mind, I might just tell you what my thoughts are on it. Um, I hate musicals. I've got to be really upfront, but um, I got to say that I think a lot of the people that have jumped on this kind of ableism criticism have missed the point. In the sense that I actually think the debate that you created around it has been really, really interesting, and I've been really challenged by it. Like you said, you've, you know, okay, you might be ableist, and I've had to think about that for myself as well. And I think that is what good art should always do. And I actually think that this is, sure, it's a movie, you know, it's a movie length and you go to a cinema and it's going to be beautiful and you need to see it on a big screen to appreciate it. But um, really what it is, I think it's got to be moved out of the genre of movie because it's, it's art and good art always challenges where we're at in the status quo. And you may not have set out to do that, but that's where it's landed and it's landed at a perfect time. And <laughs> I describe it as a, I describe this to somebody who's making my coffee this morning. It's a creative deposit by Sia. And for me, there's a line in, I think it's either from a song or maybe Kate Hudson says it, but it's like, I think it's just one of the songs, um, take a trip in my mind. And I, I actually think. Don't take a trip into my magic mind. That's it. It was a song. Um, but it's it's like, yep, that's what we get. And I actually think that's the greatest gift you can give us is a trip inside your mind, your creative mind. And back to this idea that you you don't drop an idea and you don't 
um, doubt it. You go with it. And I know David Chappelle described it once as creativity arrives, it honks at horn, it pulls outside your your house and it honks its horn and you just got to get in. You can't pack your lunch. You can't go, got to go and clean my teeth first. And you can't get in the driver's seat. You got to get in the passenger seat and you just got to get in and see where it takes you. And I'm just wondering if you can describe a little more about that idea of, I think you described it as jumping from a cliff. Yeah. Can you just talk that through? Because I'm fascinated and I'm scared by it because my life has been about and I think there's a bipolar condition or bipolar-esque, you're running down a hill, it's taking you there, and I have a fear that it's going to take me too fast that my legs lose connection with the ground. And my sense is Sia has always allowed her legs to move, to leave the ground. You go so fast, so far, so deep, so expansive. You let your feet leave the ground, you lose connection, and um, I know that's hard for you. But for the rest of us, we get to get an insight into how limitless we can be. And I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, thanks for saying all that stuff because it made me cry. Aww. And um, I really appreciate your support because um, my, definitely my intentions were good and um, I re- just really appreciate it. And, yes, we have to look at it. We have to, I've learned a lot and I've had to look at myself and, you know, and am I ableist and all that sort of stuff. And um, But you're right, we're similar. And the way that I've always viewed it is that, um, like, the reason that I take medication is so that I don't end up in the basement. Mm-hmm. And it has meant that I ha- I've had to give up sometimes living in the sky, living in the clouds or living by the sun. Yeah. Um, but, I, I'll, I, but now I just hit the roof. Um, <laughs> but I don't end up in the basement. I just, I just end up with my face lying on the floor, you know. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's what um, medication has done for me. Um, but create not creatively. Um, I feel like uh, a lot of people get afraid about taking medication that it's going to kill their creativity. Yeah. But for me, it actually freed me. Um, uh, because when I was unmedicated, I was a danger to myself. Yeah. And um, and I'm still able to completely imagine what it's like to go further in each direction mm. because I have been. I've been there. And once you've been there once, twice, three times, four times, you never forget mm. what it's like to fly near the sun or to uh, mm. end up in the basement. And so I don't need to live that anymore. And it's sort of, I think, Sisyphean to like <laughs> uh, to live without without the support of m- medical intervention um, from me. I know that you've gone there very closely. You've wanted to die and then you've wanted to live clearly. I guess there was always a little voice that was there that was just like, yeah, I want to live. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, just there going like, you want to live. Um, <laughs> and it would, you know, pick up, pick up the phone, right, even if I'd already taken the overdose, you know. You've also been motivated by service. You're a good little girl who's motivated by service and I think I feel that from you. I feel that you will want to keep creating and showing us our limitlessness. I really want to be pat, pat on the head and told I'm a good girl and I'm, it's like, and that, I, that desperate need to be liked is a, definitely a defect and, that, like, I'm really working on that at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and on the and, and on the defensiveness that you know I showed on the first bunch of answers, and also I was being like facetious, and I do have a sense of humour, but I obviously I hurt some feelings, so I, that's not ever my intention. Um, no, you know, but yeah, I w- I was uh, I I learned I learned a lot. I I learned that I should sometimes definitely always actually past midnight shut the fuck up and um on social media. Yeah. And I learned that um I 
am or was unintentionally ableist and I learned what ableism is and I learned that whilst I did a lot of research, um, I did maybe, you know, I talked to 20 subsets of the autism community that there were another 20 that I didn't talk to. And so, you know, whilst some people don't like to be referred to as autistic, they like to be referred to as a person on the autism spectrum, other people are like, why aren't you saying autistic? It's annoying. Um, And, um, you know, and others found it condescending that I would say special abilities when, in fact, the Down syndrome person that I cast in the movie said that that's what he preferred. He liked being called special abilities because that's what he, because he felt like he did have special abilities. And so, you know, I I was, um, I was doing my best and I just, I'm, I'm, there's just so many factions and subsets of every uh, minority. I remember when I was dating JD and I uh, went into lesbian world for three and a half years and I realised it was like a whole new branch of the library had opened up to me. <laughs> but even, even there was still like another like 40 aisles that I didn't get to in that three and a half years, this internal homophobia and so much like that I didn't get to. And so I realised that um, in the same way um, the autism community similarly has a lot of sub-factions and sub, like, yeah, sub-factions yeah. and that uh, I didn't I didn't talk to everybody and, in fact, just like there is only, you know, they say if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Well, I only talked to 20, like, communities of people with autism and there's another 20 communities of people with autism that I didn't speak to or speak for. And, um, and So, yeah, uh, your consideration around all of this, the fact that you're talking through all of this, it's another aspect of what you are giving, you're putting it on the agenda and the fact that you're willing to go first is is um is a real is a real gift. And look, I wanna I actually would love to round things off. Um in the movie I know that this is another theme. Uh Kate Hudson I think has a line referring to the fact that she's trying to drown out loneliness. I know you've spoken about it. Where are you at with loneliness now as you've put this movie out? I'm so good now. Because I, I've been, I am so lucky. I have the resources to a uh, coronavirus test the people I love, <laughs> and have them over on a regular basis, and still wear masks and social distance. But like I, um, you know, I believe, you know, we've seen the rates of suicide and uh, relapse go up so much in the last year, and I would be there along with them if it weren't for the, you know, if they, you know, I've always said fame is a gift and a curse and the gift in this case is that I have the resources to um, to test my friends and to quarantine with my friends for periods of time um, and uh, that I've managed to stay connected. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm just really grateful for, for that. And f- 2020. i think the old ways i think uh 2021 will become what we need it to become if we if we make it that way hey um i know you i've overstepped um my timing on all of this thank you so much sia um you've been a gift to me i appreciate it see you mate yeah thanks for helping me kind of process more about this all of this thanks I actually sound so nervous and fangirly in that chat. I'm not sure if you hear it either, but I'm also really emotional. Here's the thing I took from the chat. Sia's like a true artist, the genius kind, who goes down in history books and who we realise maybe much later down the track that she helped us or her art helped us navigate tough stuff going on in our lives at the time with their art but also their sacrifice. These kind of artists get us thinking like widely and wildly and our culture is always better for it, I think. 
So I really do feel her film should not be seen as a bog standard feature film, but instead as art that exists and, as it turns out in this case, to challenge us about ideas around ableism and also perhaps gives us a compassionate and inspiring peek into a genius's mind, which in turn gets us to maybe experience our own limitlessness. This is what art does, and I think we have to give a longer leash to artists like Sia who take this risk and who make this sacrifice. What I found most interesting, and I don't know if you feel the same way, because maybe it reflects my own fear of what will happen if I run full throttle down that hill with my own creative process and my speaking up on stuff in public that scares people, is that she is 100% confident doing this kind of risk-taking, confident in leaping off that cliff in her work life or flying close to the sun, as she says. She just pays for it in her private life. I think for all of us who grapple with this, whether in our work or our personal lives, we want to know, well, how do we leap and take the risk or go to our edge and not let the fear hold us back like Sia manages to do? In our chat, Sia shows us we can make this really artful. It can be a creative process in itself. We can practice flying as high as the ceiling rather than the sky or too close to the sun so that we don't fall through to the basement and perhaps just land face down on the floor from time to time, as she says. Sia takes medication. She does radical therapy. She meditates and she surrounds herself with people, other ceiling hovering artists who who back her and make her feel less alone. I've got to say, I, I do much the same and I do regard it as another way of creating art. It's a lifelong practice for me of getting grounded and solid and modulating my mania and my health like every day. For me, it's via meditating and exercising every single morning and having these regular writing chats, as I call them with myself, which is a very unstructured journal writing thing I do. And also working in climate activism, that totally grounds me. And when I'm grounded and being a friend with myself like this, I can, I find I can jump more wildly and push the edge and I can trust that I will land, not in a chaotic heap, but I suppose in the best place for moving forward. Wild was presented by me, Sarah Wilson, and it's produced in collaboration with Podcast One Australia. Producer Lindsay Green, audio producer Chris Marsh, executive producer Sam Kavanagh. For more episodes, download the free Podcast One Australia app or search Wild Podcast with Sarah Wilson. And my friends, let's remember, we have a one wild and precious life together on this planet. Let's do it like we mean it.